All right, so uh, good morning. I know a lot of you are coming down directly from the breakfast and you probably had no idea who I was and it was like, oh, it's this opening speech. I should go see that. So uh, thank you for doing that out of obligation or whether you wanted to come see me speak. So uh, to, a, to a pay you for this generous donation of your time, I'm going to tell you a small secret about myself beyond everything that John just told you. Now I'm doing this for two reasons. One, because it's highly relevant to what I'm going to talk about today. And two, because I want you to trust me a little more. Now, I read once upon a time that if you want someone to trust you, you need to open up and lead with the trusting first. And we know that the more we trust someone, the more likely we are to implement and follow any advice they give us. And today, I think I'm going to give you some really good advice. And I want to increase the chances of you listening to it and following it, even if that's only by an infinitesimally small amount. So, if you've been following some of the posts about the event over the past few months, then you've already kind of seen my secret. If, if you haven't, that's okay, I'm still gonna tell you. And my secret is that this is my first time public speaking, All right? <laughs> No, I'm not, I'm not telling you this so you take it easy on me and you forgive any of my missteps or mispronunciations or stutters, mmms and ahs and all those odd fillers. No. I'm telling you that so that you can know that no matter how calm and collected I seem up here, I'm really terrified inside. <laughs> right? my, I feel like someone's kicking my stomach in a thousand different places. My palms are kind of sweaty, I think. Uh, my heart's beating outside of my chest and I'm not going to I'm not sure I'm going to remember to breathe on the next breath, let alone the entirety of my speech. But I'm still up here. I'm still up here because this is something I really wanted to do. I really wanted a chance to stand in front of people and to speak and share any kind of insight about my life that could help another person. You know, most people have a very one-sided relationship with fear. I don't. I see things and I'm afraid of them and if I have to do them, I go do them. It's not most people. Most people see a thing, they have a reaction towards it, and if that reaction is fear, then they do one of two things. They run from it, or in more insidious cases, they try to destroy it. What I'm here today to do is to help you get a better relationship with fear. So you don't run off from things and you don't try and stamp things out that terrify you. Now, before I do that, I'm going to take you back a few months. I was looking at my email, and I, it's actually like six months almost. And I'm sitting around on Twitter working on my blog and doing some writing, and I get a message from John. And John goes, hey, man, I really like your stuff. I like your blog. I like your Twitter. It's like a lot of things you're doing. I was like, man, that's cool, man. Thank you. And he goes, I'm on this, I put together this conference, a functional program, which I had no idea what that was. And he goes, I think you'd make a great keynote speaker for this. Would you be interested in doing something like that? And I said, sure, man, sign me up. I'm all for it. And he goes, great. You got any speaking experience? And I went, not really. <laughs> and by not really, I meant none at all. And I must have been convincing enough over the course of the next few exchanges on Twitter because here I am standing in front of you making what one post about the event called as my public speaking debut. My public speaking debut. <laughs> I really like the sound of that. It's like uh, you guys get to share my first words with me. So I hope that makes you trust me a little more because now I am being more vulnerable in front of you. You know, public speaking is interesting because when I was doing a lot of research on how to put this thing together, I kept coming across this interesting fact, and that fact is that public speaking is the most common fear. More people are afraid of public speaking than, than snakes or heights or planes. Death, more people are afraid of public speaking than death. <laughs> that means that more people would rather be interred beneath us than up here where I'm at on display in front of all of you. Even more interesting to me though, then that fact is just the idea of fear in general. You know, what we're afraid of, why we're afraid of it, and what we give up when we succumb to those fears. 
Now, I'm not like a psychologist or a psychiatrist by trade or even like a pop psychologist or psychiatrist. I'm just a regular guy who's really interested in these things because of how I have had to deal with them and how I've had to overcome them. And I know I'm in a room with a lot of smart people, but you don't have to be brilliant to follow what I'm going to say or to take anything from it. You just have to listen with an open heart and an open mind as I teach you about the hidden costs of fear and how to get a better deal on dealing with it. Now, I named the speech that way for a certain reason. And that reason is once upon a time, uh, back when I decided I was going to go back to school, I, I was going to study economics. And you'll see later why that's insane, right? Uh, I was going to study economics. Ultimately, I decided to go with physics, but economics is my first love. I really like a lot of the concepts and ideas that we have and that we, we take from the study of economics. And a lot of people mistakenly believe that economics is the study of money. And that's not really true. That's more finance. Economics is really the study of value, how we assign that value, and the decisions we make based on that allocation of the concepts that we take from economics, perhaps none is more powerful than the one of opportunity cost. But in its power is also a subtlety. It's very difficult for a lot of people to get their minds around the idea of opportunity cost because opportunity cost forces us to measure not only that which has not been, but that which will likely never be. Now the official definition of opportunity cost is the loss of potential gain from other alternatives when one of those alternatives is selected. And I got that definition from Google. I just typed opportunity cost in. Google gave me some a thing at the beginning. It was like a dictionary, and I took that. And while that's technically correct, I don't really like it. I don't like it because it's not intuitive. It's not clear. It doesn't hit you in the gut with meaning and run off with your previously held misconceptions like a thief in the night. Now, so... Since I want to change the way you think about things, I went ahead and I made some alterations to the definition. Now, don't worry, my alterations are not too drastic. I didn't go rewrite Webster's. I just made some small changes, so hopefully the idea gets across more clearly. Opportunity cost is what we give up when we get something else. That's easy to imagine. You can easily imagine giving up something to get something else. You know, maybe you decide to stay in and work on coding instead of go out to a party. Or you decide to go right into the workforce instead of go to college. Or you haven't seen your friends in a while. You may have met this hottie on the internet for a date. But instead you go, you know, I haven't seen my friends in a while. And they're always going to be there for me. I don't know what's going to happen with this person. So I'm going to go out and see my friends. In each of these instances, you have given up one thing and got something else. Now, it doesn't really matter what you gave up. What matters is that you wanted two things that competed for your time, and you chose one, and you gave up the other one. Now, it's one thing when you make the decision based on rational, objective measurement. You reason that your coding skills are going to make you a lot of money in the future, so you can party all you want later. And you don't need to go party now. You reason that college is a scam. It's going to take all your money and put you into a serious debt. Better get to work now and pick up some skills. Or maybe you think, huh, the rest of all, all these other dates I've gone on, they have turned out horribly. So I'm going to just play the odds and go with my friends because there's no way this is going to work out. You made your decision based on rationality, based on logic, and you feel good about it. But let's be real here, people. That's not how people make decisions. People don't make decisions logically. We make it based on how we feel. We see something, we have a reaction, we react, right? And then we go back later and use the facts to defend why we did something. And there's nothing wrong with that. That's just part of human nature. There's no getting around that. It's been with us forever and it's going to keep being with us forever. But the problem is when 
we think about how we're going to feel about something, we usually imagine the worst case scenario. And we make our decision based on that. We don't make a decision based on the odds of it actually happening. We make a decision based on how we would feel if it happens. And in our minds, it's definitely going to happen. We don't go out, not because we're good coders and we want to work on that. We stay in because we are terrified of socializing and we think it's going to be horrible and someone's going to make fun of us and put a video up on YouTube or something of us being awkward. We don't go to college because we're terrified of failing out and looking foolish. And we don't go on that date because we're pretty sure we're going to get rejected again. We can't deal with that. We're going to feel horrible. Now, in each of those examples, I haven't explicitly said you're afraid of the outcome. But make no mistake about it, fear is what drives this decision. And what are we really afraid of in the instance? You know, what, what are we so afraid of that causes us to miss out on a possibly life-changing opportunity? We're not afraid of getting hurt. We're not afraid of dying even, at least not as much as public speaking. <laughs> We're afraid of being exposed. We're afraid of vulnerability. And our ego is responsible for this fear. Our ego makes us feel separated and feel exceptional, and that's not a bad thing. You know, the ego is a really interesting thing, for real to me. On the one hand, the ego makes you feel, well, the ego is responsible for your self-image and your self-esteem. It gives you the confidence to act, the courage to believe that whatever you do is going to come to fruition, and the resolve to endure any kind of hardship or difficulty en route to that goal. It infuses you with the belief that you're exceptional and what you do is going to happen. And this is really the ego at its best. But what happens when you see yourself as so exceptional that you view any challenge as a threat instead of an opportunity for growth? You then become so afraid to step outside of your comfort zone that you do not take any risk and you do not grow, and you do not improve. And this is the ego at its worst, at its most stifling. You don't want to be seen as average. You don't want to be seen as common like everyone else with problems. You stay in and work on your coding ability instead of going out, because even though you're an outstanding top 1% coder in the world, you are horrible at dealing with people. And those two extremes cancel out and they make you average. Or if you focus on the horrible part of it, the worst part, you just feel terrible. You don't go to school because you've told yourself that you're this intellectual, you're this superior person mentally, and rather than put that to the test and have it confirmed, you just want to believe that because if you, you don't succeed, then you have nothing. Your mentality and your superior ego is, is canceled out. You become common like everyone else. Or you don't go on a date because you've told yourself you're a super attractive person and you have all these great qualities and another failed relationship, another failed connection works against that belief you've told yourself and the belief you have in yourself. So the ego wants to protect you from this type of exposure again. Now, I keep using these examples for a reason. Aside from the relevance of standing in front of a room full of programmers, there is also a highly personal element for me. I'm going to open up and be a little more vulnerable again to you so you learn some more about me. You know, once upon a time, I was a terrible math student in high school. I mean, like, bad. I had to get my transcripts for transferring, and I was like, how in the world did I ever even survive, man? This is awful. Uh, C's, highest things I had, right? Now, why I was terrible at math isn't really relevant. It has a lot to do with the neighborhood I grew up in and the things I was around. But, why, but what is relevant is that I let those difficulties and those challenges and hardships define myself mentally 
And I thought I had no future in anything quantitative. And for whatever reason, my 17 year old self reasoned that that means I had no future in anything at all. Right around this time, I received some harsh criticisms about different writings I did, whether they were just my fictions or essays I turned in. Teachers didn't like my style and I was being a little rebellious. So I was like, oh, you know, that's my style. You do what you want. Uh, some of my classmates were like these, these snooty liberal reading types that were very like, I'm going to read this, that, or the other. And I didn't like the science fiction that I was writing for whatever. So they were like, hey, you're going to have no success in writing. So I left college, I left high school with no belief in my ability to do math and no belief in my ability to write. And I don't want to make it sound like uh, high school was this great crushing point in my life, but I definitely left more courage in my ability to rush the lawn. I had played football and I was not bad at that, right? And then I tried to go to college, I did. I went for, for a year at the University of Rochester and I failed out. I tell myself I left of my own free will, but it was more like uh, you can't fire me, I quit kind of situation. <laughs> so I left and I, I'm back home and I'm, I'm hanging around with kids my own age, a bunch of 19, 20, 21 year olds. And I don't have any confidence in my intellect and I don't feel like I have a future these kids do. But I need some way to feel superior, or rather my ego does. So I look, I look, I look, I look, and I find one place where I can outdo everyone. I can become the best partier they know. I can drink more than everybody and drink anyone under the table and drink everyone under the table I did. For four, five, six, who knows, I'm losing count now, years, I, I spent most of the time trying to find a party to get drunk at or being drunk or drinking on my own, things like that. And, and I really became an alcoholic. I put a heavy strain on myself. A lot of relationships, I put a strain on some of them I don't have anymore. Many I didn't start because, I mean, you know, I don't know if anyone would have got along with me sober, but they never met me sober, so who knows, right? And um, it was difficult, but hey, I remember this, uh, I remember this time in my life real clearly, and something really big had happened that, that was going to define what I decided to do with my future. But before I tell you what that was and how we got a handle on it, there's one more really personal element of it. So around this time, I had, I had just went on this great date with this, with this girl I met on the internet. And it was, it, was, it was cool, man. I was like, wow, man, people like this really exist. It's great. And so I wanted another one, and I wanted another one, and it just kept getting cool. Now, at this point, I have no idea how she feels about me, right? I think she's cool. I, who knows how she, how she sees me. She keeps showing up, so I assume things are going well. But then my ego starts whispering that nonsense in my ear, man. He's like, hey, man, you know you're not really anything. You know you're not worth much. You don't have any prospects in your life or in your future. She's going to find out, man. You got to get out of here. You got to get back to what you know, man, which is, which is short-term flings, man, because you don't have anything for the long term. You got to get out of here. And I really didn't want to listen to my ego. I really didn't. I tried to ignore him, but he, man, he's loud, man. He's powerful. So I did, and I, I bounced on this relationship. I just left. Very, and I remember this point super, super vividly. It was, I just had my professional boxing debut. I was surrounded by attention and adoration by many people, but I really, really felt alone. And I was, I was fearful. I was, was fearful myself and for myself because it's amazing what you did, the things you think are a good idea when you're in a constant state of inebriation. And I was fearful for my future. I was like, what in the world am I gonna do? You know, and I was cold, man, like figuratively and literally in the middle of January. <laughs> but I did have my friends. I, every bar I went to, I had a comp, so I didn't have to pay for any drinks. So I had my friends, my drinks, and I had my ego. 
very snuggled up at this point, very close. That's all he got, all I got. But uh, eventually I, I overcame and, and dealt with that and finished that guy off and put him in the back burner. The kid that was horrible at math now is in the final semester of a physics degree. The kid that had, he had no confidence in his ability to write or express himself or didn't believe the world would want to read anything he wrote. Now has a few published books and a great blog where people come and read and comment and, and it makes me feel good. And that date that I bounced on through some incredible grace of powers higher than myself, who knows how it happened. Uh, I'm back with her and now I can't get rid of her. She's followed me out to Colorado. She's in the back holding the phone up recording. You know. So, so how'd I do this? How'd I beat the ego monster? What is the solution? I've been dangling in front of you for this speech. Well, while I sat and I thought about this one day, I thought about this a lot, and I realized that at the end of the day, no matter what I did with my life, I was going to die. It's the same for everybody in here. No matter how great you are, whether you invent something cool or not, you know, whether you make people love you or hate you, the music's going to stop. And when it stops, we know four things for certain. We can debate about a lot of things regarding death, but there's four things we know for certain. We know that once we check out, we can't check back in. We know we can't take anything with us. We know that we can no longer affect anyone on this side directly. And we know that no one on this side can no longer affect us. It's the four things we know about death for sure. You're born, you kid around for a while, you hit puberty, sex becomes your driving force in life, you may or may not reproduce, you kid around for a little more, and then you're out of here. You get 60 to 80 years to do whatever you're gonna do, right? Now, a lot of people, the more pessimistic types are gonna hear that and go, oh man, what's the point of all this then? What are you telling me? And I'm like, look, I'm not telling you which, how you should live your life. What I'm saying is that whether you go and decide you want to be a crackhead, sleeping in the trash can every night, or you want to add fulfillment to someone else's life, it's going to stop. And I'm no expert, but I've lived my life in such a manner that I've seen both ends of the spectrum. And I can tell you right now that the people who add more to people's lives and do more and become better they're happy in a little 60 to 80 years on this planet. So I think about this, I think about it, and then I realize how silly is it of me to care what my ego wants or what other people think. I'm only going to be alive for a really, really short amount of time. I actually worked this out, just this cool analogy one day. I was writing something else. The universe is like 13.82 billion years old. That's like... 15, 18 zeros, maybe. You're going to be alive for two zeros, three, maybe, if you're lucky. That means if the universe was an eyeball, you'd be alive for less than one-tenth of a second of its blink. So it doesn't matter uh, what you do in the long run at all. <laughs> and that's, that's kind of depressing, but it's not depressing at all because it lets you know that you get to make whatever you want of this life. You don't have to worry about being exposed because the moment you get exposed, I was just talking to this guy. I said, hey, you know how I, how I think about why I'm not nervous? Because in 20 minutes, you're going to forget most of what I say. And you're going to be focused on <laughs> what you learn. And you might remember one or two things that are really important. And that's, that's all that matters because I've added some, some, some blah. I've given you fulfillment. I've added something to your life. That's how I'm going to use my 60 to 80, right? Now, that's just, that's just the mental part of it, right? I don't want to give you a piece of intellectual advice without a follow-up. You know, because it's one thing to know something up here. It's another thing to know it viscerally. So you have to experience that your actions are meaningless. You have to go and take risks. There's something that you want to do that your fear is holding you back from doing, you know? 
maybe there's somebody you want to talk to, maybe there's some level of the code that you are apprehensive about learning because you're so comfortable in one method of doing things. Either way, you have to take these risks. And I'm only saying the risks you take are going to be harmless. You're going to escape safe and without any damage done. No. Anyone that can tells you that, they're selling you something, and if it works, then they're going to be very rich, and if not, you've been scammed. Sorry. All you have to do, all you get to do, is try things and realize you're not going to be hurt. And even if you do, what does it matter? In a few years, you're not going to be here. And in 150 years tops, there's going to be no one around that remembers you directly anyway. So you have to make what you want in this life, and hopefully you make something good that you want to pass on. Enjoy that you feel good about doing. You know, so I'll, I'll leave you with this. I'll leave you with this quote that I remember, and I don't know where I heard it from. I wish I could attribute it uh, properly. I just take it as my own now, but I can't. You know, the best and the worst things in life walk hand in hand. They're like a, a coin. You can't avoid one and reap the benefits of the other. For every good, you know, you gotta. Put yourself at risk for some bad. As they say more cheesily, you can't know light without darkness, right? And remember, man, the darkness is going to go away, and so is the light, and so will you one day. So go and embrace some challenges, change your life, and hopefully do something fulfilling that makes you feel happy. With that, thank you for hearing me speak.